Anyway, uh, let's talk about missions. Today is Mission Sunday, um, and I think as we go into today, it's important to ask or answer these two questions. Uh, what First, what is missions? And then second, uh, why do we do missions? Well, um, I, the missions definition that I'm going to give you today, there's a couple of them out there. I'm going to use this as missions is a cross-cultural endeavor to help people experience God as their treasure more than any other treasure. And we actually heard Josh talk about this, how we can create little G gods, and we use that a lot. We can create little G gods in our world. And so missions is going, uh, it's an endeavor to help people to experience God as as their main treasure, their treasure, more than any other treasure in the world, more than sports, money, um, our kids, you know, more than anything. You know, I, I know there's probably a lot of uh, people out here that love the Dallas Cowboys. You know, I'm a Packers fan myself. You know, don't hate me for that. But I love, I love me some Packers. But we have to love God more. We have to love God more. So that's, that's what missions is. Missions is this idea of cross-cultural endeavor to help people experience God as their treasure more than any other treasure. Why do we have missions? Well, we have missions. It's very simple. If you go to uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, it's the Great Commission. I'm sure all of you, if you've been here for a little while, you've heard it talked about, the Great Commission. Reach, teach, multiply is our, our kind of motto here, and that comes from that as well. So Matthew 28, 19 through 20 tells us two things. It tells us to make disciples. Well, it tells us more than two things, but two things that I'm going to talk about. It tells us to make disciples, and it tells us to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. So we are commanded to go and make disciples and to teach other people, but Really, what is the heart behind missions? Well, and, 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 and really, why do we have missions? Well, missions isn't necessarily the goal of the church. Missions, John Piper says it this way. He says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. So, Missions, why we have missions is because worship doesn't exist. Well, who are we supposed to be worshiping? We're supposed to be worshiping God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Spirit. And David Platt, I love the way he says this. He says, God's end goal in the world is that his glory would be known and enjoyed among the nations. And as, as, as you look at scripture from Genesis to Revelation, you see this, you see this idea of God's glory being known. And, and you see a redemptive arc from Genesis to Revelation where God created man and God is redeeming man. And so at the end, we're going to see all people of all nations, all languages, all people groups, they're going to be worshiping God. That is the goal, worship of God. And, and if you've been reading scripture that somehow we have, we're the center of, of the Bible. The Bible has been referenced multiple ways. You know, we've heard it be called, it's a love letter to you and, and just a very thing. The Bible is a story about God. It's about God. It's not about us. It's about God, about exalting his name bringing glory to him. It's not about us. It's about him. So if you've been reading the Bible thinking that the Bible is about you somehow, then you've been reading the Bible wrong because the Bible is about him and bringing him glory. And we see this in Psalm 96, 3. It says, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the people. Isaiah 12, 4 says, make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim his name to be exalted in Romans 15, 9, it, it says that God sent Jesus on his mission in order that the Gentiles might, might glorify God for his mercy. In Romans 9, 7, it says that God does mighty works in history that his name might be proclaimed in all the earth. In John Stoll's uh, 
commentary on, on Romans, he says this. He says, the highest of missionaries' motives is neither obedience to the Great Commission, as important as that is, nor the love for sinners who are alienated and perishing. Strong as the incentive is, especially when we contemplate the wrath of God, but rather a zeal, a burning passion, a burning and passionate zeal for the glory of Jesus Christ. There is only one imperialism, and that is Christianity, and that is concern for his imperial majesty, Jesus Christ, and for the glory of his empire. And he says this in, in relation to Romans 1, 5, when Paul is summing up his calling as a missionary, and he's saying, I am called to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Notice he says, for the sake of his name. And in the Westminster Confession, it says that the chief end of man is to bring glory to God and enjoy him forever. We are to do things for his, for the sake of his name. So Stock goes on to say, and he says, we should be jealous for the honor of his name, troubled when it remains unknown, hurt when it is ignored, indignant when it is blasphemed, and it, all the time anxious and determined that it should be given the honor and glory which are due to it. So that is why we have missions. We have missions because worship doesn't exist. We have missions to bring glory to God, to exalt his name to the nations, to the people who have not heard his name. To share the good news so that they may worship him. Worship the only name that is worthy of worship. So as, as we hear these three missionaries that are going to come up and, and talk today, um, I, I want you to be thinking through these two things of what missions is and why we have missions. So we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and ask Frankie V to, to join me up here, and he's going to be our first um, one this morning. And thank you, Frankie, for joining us. And, and Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's a privilege to be uh, to be here and um, just give you a recap and a summary of specifically Stillwater Bible Institute. As some of you may know, we've been uh, teaching uh, here at the Rolette campus and also in Ixtapaluca, Mexico, uh, the gospel. And um, that's a privilege for us to be able to do this. Let me, let me begin with uh, a little background of how this got started. Bible Training Center for Pastors was created by Dr. Dennis Mock, a biblical scholar. His vision was to bring biblical training and equipping to places where logistically and cost-wise wouldn't be possible. This program has been translated into 40 different languages and is taught in over 50 different countries. Dr. John Schimmel and Pastor Kurt Horting had the opportunity to attend a conference where they were officially certified to be able to bring the church leaders, future pastors, students, disciples, church staff, and church members, the scriptures in a more friendly way. In the spring of 2018, we started here in Rolette campus, our first class, Bible study methods and rules of interpretation. We have here a few students that were part of it, and here, this first class, we uh, were wanting to teach them how to study the Bible. Here I have for you a curriculum of this course. 
We have Bible study methods. We have Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, preaching biblical messages, Bible doctrine survey, personal spiritual life, church ministry, administration and education, teaching principles and methods, church history and missions and evangelism and discipleship. A total of 520 hours. The curriculum was designed to reach, teach, and multiply, like Evan said. The objective is this program was to equip pastors, teachers, disciples, students, church leaders, elders, staff members, so they could repeat the process. See, the way it works is like this. You take the first class, which it will be um, Bible studies and rules of interpretations, and then after you've taken it, you're certified to teach it. So we're multiplying. By you taking this class, you are certified to teach it to others. We have a book that guides exactly how to do it. You don't have to think it. We give you the book. you got the curriculum with you. As I mentioned earlier, we have been offering here locally in Roulette so far around 240 hours of biblical formal training. And this has brought us the opportunity to equip the saints, which is a commandment from Jesus Christ. COVID-19 has brought new opportunities to use technology to be able to reach out to those students elsewhere here in the United States and around the world. Our classes move from live classes to cyber classes. We have students joining from Colorado, from New York, Palestine, Texas, in Mexico City area. As you can see the pictures, this was our first semester finishing Bible study methods and rules of interpretations, and we were so grateful to be there. The people had so much gratitude. They worked a full-time job, 40, 50 hours a week, and every other Saturday, they sat down with us for eight hours to learn the gospel. Wow, they really thought that was valuable. See, after we taught this 42 students that graduated, they're able to multiply and teach others. We have a few uh, students that are teaching already other students. They grab two, three students, and they're teaching them how to study the Bible. So you see, we are reaching, we are teaching, and we're multiplying. Also, because of the COVID-19, um, we uh, had to stop our Old Testament survey class in Mexico City. So, yes, you guessed it right. We've been Zooming every other weekend. And we've been finishing the class. Hopefully, we'll be finishing the second semester in Mexico City this fall. We are so uh, grateful to be able to do what we're doing. The people in Mexico, they are so grateful that we brought formal training to them that otherwise wouldn't have been accomplished. I have a video from uh, uh, Martin, one of the pastors that we've been teaching, and from Rod Fry, one of our friends, and connections in Mexico City. So, Scott, if you please play that video. Hello, I am Martin Mendez, pastor of Sendero de Vida Church, and this is my wife, Laura. This time, we want to thank God first, and then each member of the Still Waters Church and the Institute for many reasons, your prayers, the books, the study Bibles, dictionaries, and other materials that have been sent to us. 
as well as for giving financial support so that our brothers John and Frank have came to start a study seminar with us and this is the, the main uh, gratitude we have to you. We also appreciate that our brothers John and Frank have continued to teach the classes remotely in despite the pandemic. We can continue with this training which has been a great blessing for each one of us. Our brothers John and Frank have been concerned that each class is understandable and have shown us much of the love from them and from the church still wires uh, to, uh, to us. And we are very grateful since this study is providing a very good review for some and also very useful tools and new knowledge for the majority. It has encouraged a deeper study of the word of God in all. We wish God to pour out abundant blessings on each of you. Receive a big hunk and our gratitude from me, my wife and everyone in the church. Thank you very much. So uh, this was uh, uh, Martin. He's a pastor for one of the churches. There are three churches in Mexico that we're teaching. Uh, and we're still planting some more. So the equipping that we're doing is actually a great benefit for them. Um, I also want to bring another video uh, quickly with uh, is Rod Fry. He's one of our con connection in Mexico City. And he's been planting churches there for the last 20 years. Church from Mexico City, good to see you again, or kind of see you again. Uh, just wanted to give you a brief kind of update and word uh, regarding the uh, theological education by extension classes, the, uh, the classes that, um, that John and Frank are involved with here with us. Um, uh, a few months ago, they gave out um, t-shirts that apparently you also perhaps received uh, that said, I love his church. And that certainly is, um, that certainly describes my attitude towards the church and uh, really what I feel like should be uh, many, it's all our attitudes towards the local church. Because the local church is a place where discipleship happens, a place where people are encouraged, they're edified, they're exhorted, they're taught, um, they're just energized and, and empowered. Um, in their faith and to uh, to continue to obey uh, God's word and also to to reach the world, um, the classes um, really are a key part of church leadership. Um, in our situation and in many situations around the world, you have a young church, an economically challenged church, a church that's pretty much impossible to send. Um, a man and his and his wife or family to a formal seminary and the the classes um, that we've been uh, receiving here hermeneutics Bible study methods and now Old Testament survey have been just a real godsend um, it's it's really interesting too in the months ahead both uh, my wife and I and the Cottrells the two missionary families um, here in Ixtapaluca will both be absent for a period of time and so we'll be leaving this newest church of the church that's been planted now uh, for about three and a half years in the hands of of um, three men and their wives. Um, and so it's 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 really come at a key time um, this training because they're really going to have to put it in practice. So we thank you for all your support um, of John and Frank and the, and the ministry here. Although it's kind of it been different this past class, these past several months online um, it really feels like it's, it's been something that um, that God has um, has sent and this partnership is is from him thanks so uh, as you could see uh, um, because of Stillwater 
Community Church, Stillwater Bible Institute, we were able to do what we're doing. Uh, I just want to thank you for the support. We want to thank you because you're supporting his great commission. And we couldn't be more grateful to be part of his purpose. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for all the goodness and all the blessings that you bring to our lives. Please lead us and give us the wisdom we need to serve you and to continue your mission. We pray to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, Stillwater. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Marley. Um, you normally see me in kids' ministry um, in some capacity, um, but today I am honored to be here to get to talk a little bit about my um, mission in Spain. So thank you for having me. Um, I did struggle a little bit on where to start because... Um, there's a lot to this story, um, but, and also to sum it up in a short amount of time. So um, I thought I would start with 2018. Um, that year, uh, the Heights, my former church, had several mission trips. They put out a pamphlet, had all these mission trips, and I looked at it, and I, was, I saw Russia, I saw Honduras, I saw England, and all those places are really awesome. And even the mission work that they were doing in those places seemed like it was going to be great. But the thing that caught my eye was Vacation Bible School. And I thought, wow, I can do that. I've done that for 10 years, or now 10 years. I love kids. I worked in children's ministry at the time. Um, and still, and so I was like, I can do this. Didn't, didn't notice until I looked up that it's in Spain. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, but that's when the stirring in my heart began. That is when um, God was giving me a new story, and he had the pen. So after a lot of prayer and um, talking with people, wrestling with God some, I obeyed. And all of a sudden, there I was going on my first mission trip overseas, uh, well, first mission trip at all, and first trip overseas. So to a place called Girona, Spain. Um, we held, we had a VBS there. You can see the city, that's the old city, by the way, in the, there's the old part, new part, and the river um, divides it, kind of. So um, we had VBS for the local kids. We um, learned about the city, learned about the diet, uh, demographics, um, and joined in their Easter service at their church plant. Um, and so that's when I started to feel, when I was there, I started to feel a stirring of, you're coming back, God was telling me. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Again, <laughs> with the wrestling and the, I don't understand this, you told me, I'm very comfortable, as we've been talking about, uncomfortable, comfortable. I'm very comfortable serving in my community and where I live, and this is not where I live. So, um, again, lots of things um, considered in prayer. Um, but long story short, I ended up going last year. So 2019, I ended up going for three months. Quit my job, put my stuff in storage, went not knowing, is this going to be full-time my whole life? Is this just now? What is this? So it ended up being, um, I am now a, an associate with Greater Europe Mission. So I'm able to go and um, serve with them in a part-time way. I serve here stateside, just helping different um, things, still in communication with them. But uh, also I get to go back in the summers and 10 days in April. So that is just giving you a little backstory of where I am today. Um, Spain is a beautiful and diverse community, but it has a strong need for the gospel. Although Roman Catholicism has been a huge part of their past, the country 
has been o overtaken by um, secularism. There are also many immigrants that fled to Spain, uh, many who are Muslim. So um, a lot of Spaniards, they might have a background in Roman Catholicism, but they don't really care. Um, whatever their beliefs are, they just, they have this thing, I don't care. I don't really care where I'm going. I don't care anything. Um, so they... Um, they're desperate for the need um, of the hope that comes from a relationship with God. Um, so, uh, Scott's, I think, going to change the slide for me. I will be serving alongside, continuing to serve alongside, these full-time missionaries that live in Girona. We partner with Greater Your Mission, both of us. Um, they're a blessing to me. Um, I still am in constant communication with them. They are originally from Florida, and about eight years ago now, they packed up and had two kids and went to Girona to live. And they've lived there since, and they've had three kids in Girona. And they're amazing to partner with. Um, and let's see. Then I'm going to talk about my roles. So my roles there now are um, I continue to language and culture learn. Um, language is um, something that's really hard for those of you who, as an adult, it's really hard to learn. Um, I chose to learn Spanish. They have two languages over there, Catalan and Spanish, but I knew I was coming back, so I can use Spanish here as well as over there. As I didn't say this in the first service, but as I was uh, figuring out how to learn language, I got a tutor over there. Her name is Jezebel, and... Um, she does not know who, really at all who Jesus is. And so in, in her teaching me the language, I was able to kind of show her Jesus through, through me in his light, in my life. And um, we still talk today, so I still cultivate that relationship and hopefully will um, grow that relationship deeper. Um, we also do outreaches. You'll see some pictures in a little bit of... Um, some different places that we do outreaches, um, just kind of trying to get to know the community, build relationships. And then um, I will do just general support for the church plant that they have there. You'll see a picture of it. Um, and then I am involved a lot in helping um, short-term mission trip teams that come from the states to go there. I'm kind of like the states side liaison for them. Um, and then I also serve in a leadership role at Larcada. It's a Christian encampment for kids over there. They have several camps throughout the year, um, different ones. But I serve specifically at English camp. So not only are we sharing the gospel, but we're teaching them a little English. Um, and then just overall care for the leadership team and one-on-one uh, -on -one discipleship. The Greater Europe Mission has a a college age team that comes, um, kids, and I just am able to come alongside them, disciple them, guide them um, through everything. So uh, Scott had Raquel up there on the screen. She is a missionary as well, but she is a local missionary, which is pretty hard to do in that area of Spain. Um, so she's um, homegrown there in, in Girona, and I got to live with her. Um, and so that was really an awesome experience. She helped me a lot. And then that is actually fluid, is the co-working space that they have, but also the church. Um, so it serves both purposes. The co-working space is huge there. They have a lot of them. Um, and it's a way for those missionaries to invite people in, to have a business, to be able to sustain that business. Um, that's all they want is enough clients. They don't really want to make money. They just want to have enough clients to pay for the business and to bring people in, meet new people in the community, and also give them a place to work. So um, this is Larcada, the camp I was talking about. We do sleep in those teepees, and there is no air conditioning, and it's the summer, and it's hot there. Just saying. Um, but it's a wonderful place, and it is. it was a true blessing to me. It was hard. Um, I'll give you a perspective. These kids, when you go to church camp here, these kids here, you might have 
maybe two kids out of 50, we'll say, that don't really know much about Jesus or who he is. And you might have five that accept Christ at camp. There, it is the absolute opposite. You might have five that know who Jesus is and maybe one that has ever accepted Christ as their Savior. So it was a real culture shock even at camp for me uh, from a gospel perspective. I was like, what? You don't? Oh, okay. So it was kind of, I was kind of taken aback, but it was um, also awesome. Um, so that's just us at camp. Um, this is salt. So this is, I mentioned the um, immigrants that from different places. Salt is a neighboring community, and it has um, a high population of Muslims who came from Africa. And so that's just um, us getting to serve there. Um, with them. And then this is Mitchdia. This is a park in Girona where we got to go and do outreaches. We'd sing songs, have sidewalk chalk. Um, we did henna tattoos. We did all this stuff and engaging the kids in the community. Um, and we were able to do that. And I also met another lady that I still talk to at that park. Um, so that's been awesome. I just wanted y'all to know that I don't starve when I go there. This is a very, very good place to eat. <laughs> so just the different cultures of food that I've been um, partaking in. And then I'll touch on this just a little bit. So this is the Catalonia region of Spain, um, where they primarily speak Catalan. And since I've been going um, to Girona, they have been trying to um, secede and become their own um, country. And so it's an ongoing conflict in the middle of a beautiful place. And so it's very broken um, part of what you see because you'll see a divided nation. You'll see all these flags. Um, the Catalan people are very passionate about being independent. So it's really, it's a hard barrier to break. Um, and then this is just the city. I wanted, I really wanted y'all to cap see and capture the, the, the beauty that's in it, but, um, just it's really a broken place so um just be in prayer with that with me and as you go about if you're thinking about it just pray for the people of Spain people of Girona and me as I continue to go <laughs> so thank you Are we back on? Welcome back to y'all uh, that are online. Um, we're going to have one more break here in a second. Um, uh, for those of y'all that are online, I wanted to give y'all a heads up. But man, isn't it incredible to hear these stories? Uh, these stories from people that are doing God's work on a daily basis. Um, it is just incredible to hear. Um, <clears throat> Hannah shared this idea of people groups uh, um, with us. And uh, there's a ministry out there called the Joshua Project that that has done a lot of study in, into people groups and stuff. And, and we've actually, they determined that every country in the world has the gospel in it. Every country has been reached with the gospel. But that doesn't mean that the whole world has been reached with the gospel. In fact, what they found was that over 7,000 people groups across the world have not been reached with the gospel. So even though every country, every nation has, has, been, has the gospel in it, there are over 7,000 unreached people groups. That's incredible. That's, and they, they asked me... 2.6 billion people, over 2.6 billion people have not heard the gospel. So the work is there. We need people going forward in doing the work of missions. And, and that's one of the reasons, again, why we wanted to highlight uh, missions and have uh, this Mission Sunday. Um, John Piper says that in regards to mission, there's three types of Christians. There's the, the zealous goers, there's the zealous senders, and there's the disobedient. 
And we want to be a church of zealous goers and zealous senders. So we want you to be zealous goers and zealous senders. Uh, we do not want to be disobedient in the work of uh, uh, the work that God has laid out for us to do. So you might be asking, what can I do today? What can I do today to be a zealous goer and a zealous sender? Well, I'm going to ask you to do two things, to, uh, to consider two things. Uh, first, uh, one of the most important things and one of the greatest things you can do for, for each of these missions that we heard, for the missions that Stillwater is participating outside of just these three, is to pray. Pray for the missionaries that are doing the work. Pray for uh, the churches involved in missions. Pray that God would raise up more missionaries, that God would go before them, that the Holy Spirit would go before uh, the missionaries in, in their work and and. Um, open people's hearts to the missions. Pray for perseverance for missionaries. Pray for integrity. Pray for their ch- families. Pray for safety. Uh, pray for resources. And the second, the second thing I want you to pray for, and this is going to be the harder thing that I'm going to ask you to pray for. I want you to pray and ask how you can be involved. How you, what part do you play in missions? And if you're anything like me, and this is the reason why I'm going to call it a hard, a hard thing. If you're anything like me, a couple of years ago, I had to, I, I ended up going through this uh, kind of process. And, and I understand how hard it is. Um, because when you pray that prayer, when you say, God, how can I be involved? How do you want me to be involved in missions? It could be simply that he's asking you to, continue to pray every day for the missions that he led. He could be asking you to support them financially, to give of your resources toward missions, to possibly support one of the three missions that we talked about or we heard from today here. But it could be that God is asking you to be a, go- a zealous goer. And I, I I'm saying that this is so hard because in our culture, in a culture of America that is, is so ingrained in comfort and so ingrained in, in building up our own selves and, and uh, doing our own thing, of consuming, the gospel tells us to do the absolute opposite of that. That we should run toward the people that haven't heard the gospel. That we should not seek comfort. That we should pour out ourselves for the sake of the gospel. So I understand what kind of ask that is. But it's an ask that you should do. You should be open to doing the work of the gospel. Because remember, there's three types of Christians when it comes to the missions. Zealous goers, zealous senders, and the disobedient. And so if you're praying that and God is saying... I want you to be a goer, and there's a possibility that somebody in this room is praying that, and they've felt that call in their life, or online. You might have, you might have been in your prayer life, in your spiritual walk, God is calling you to missions, and, and you've been ignoring that. I'm going to encourage you to stop ignoring it. Or maybe you've even never made that. Maybe, maybe you've never asked God what you want, what he wants for you to do with your life. I want you to do that. The other thing I'm going to ask outside of prayer is is to consider giving of your resources to help further these missions. Um, Stillwater obviously supports uh, these uh, these missions, and and, and, uh, we support a variety of other missions as we do. So uh, you can give toward our missions fund if you if you want to go online and and give online there's a way you can select missions or if you're here you can write missions in there and it'll go toward our missions fund that's why we have a missions fund is because we see this as an important work of the gospel um it could be that you want to potentially um directly support um these missions and i would encourage you to talk to marley or hannah um uh, about that. And if you're wanting to directly support, you can talk to, to John or, or Frankie about the Institute or myself or Kurt. 
Um, or if you want to know about any of the other missions that Stillwater has going on, we would, we'd love to talk to you about that. So those are the two things that I, as, as you leave here today, I want you to be thinking about. I want you to be thinking, I want, you, I want to ask you to be active in your prayer life of praying for the world, praying for, praying for the world, praying for the missionaries and, and what they're doing and the work they're doing. Um, and then also just consider um, uh, uh, financially supporting that as well. Um, as we close today, I'm going to ask the missionaries to come back up. And, and Mike, if you don't mind, we're going to go off, uh, offline for just a few, few minutes as we pray for the missionaries. Um, if the missionaries can come forward, Mike, if you can take us offline.